Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to our time of worship on this beautiful Sunday and just pray that our time together will be a time of encouragement and strengthening for each one of us. Um, many items in the bulletin, it's filled up pretty good, so please hold on to them, but I'll go over uh, several of the items. Um, each, mo each Sunday morning, uh, we have coffee starting at 9.30, um, followed by morning worship. Uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, there will be at 6 o'clock a uh, memorial service for Greta Freeman. All are welcome. Wednesday, Bible study and prayer meeting at 6, followed by a trustee meeting at 7. Next Sunday, we'll have Tom Stiles as our guest speaker. Um, he is serving the Lord with Arise Ministries and speaks to churches to make us aware of the times we live in and the challenge us to be revived. Uh, backyard Bible studies uh, will start returning. Uh, Sunday evenings, there's a sign-up sheet in the, uh, on the bulletin in the hallway. Uh, I think there are three or four spots still open if you're interested in hosting. Uh, Kids Summer Fun Night, that'll be Sunday, August 8th, and that'll be from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, they'll be having inflatables along with snacks and lessons for kids ages 3 through 6th grade. Uh, yard sale to benefit the food pantry will be Saturday, uh, August 28th. Donations are welcome at any time. Uh, just see Priscilla Malarkey if you have any questions. And if you're interested in being baptized, uh, please see Pastor Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We're going to pray together for the needs that we have. There's many listed in our prayer list and others that are on our hearts, so let's join together and bring them before the Lord this morning. Father, we come before you this day and we do recognize that all through life we all have different and individual needs. Uh, sometimes our needs are the failing of this physical body or injury to this body or something to do with the, the physical nature of life. Other times we come with spiritual needs, temptations that are easily besetting us, uh, things that are trying us or discouraging us. We need encouragement and, and your help. Other times we come uh, just to, on the benefit and for others who have needs. And it seems like all in our life is, for the moment, peaceful. But for whatever reason we come, we have an assurance that you are a God who is worthy to come to, a God who is faithful when we pray to answer, and a God who provides through the abundance of your power and strength to the most difficult need that we could imagine here or the most routine need that might come up on any given day. You are more than able and capable. We bring before you this morning the needs of many who are upon a list, some of them having physical uh, needs, some of them having spiritual needs or needs for wisdom or guidance and direction, in that whatever the needs are this day, we would just trust you to meet and provide for each of these people who are listed, uh, that if it's a long-term need or cancer, that you'll not just in meet the need of their body and, and encourage uh, their body to be stronger, but also encourage their spirit to be strong that they might have endurance, that they might have strength in the midst of a long battle, such as cancer might be. For others who are recovering and doing well or improving, we're thankful for what you've done for them, but pray that you would continue. And for others who might need your hand and touch to lead them, direct them, and guide them. For those who might be away from our church family today, vacationing, traveling, that you would uh, minister safety to them. And for all of our needs, we trust you for them. Trust you for the needs of our country, the needs of our leaders to seek you, for the salvation that is found in Christ, and for the wisdom they need to make wise and godly choices. Pray for our military men and women to be uh, protected by your hand. We pray for our missionaries that serve around this world to have opportunity to share the gospel message, though some of them still uh, beleaguered by lockdowns and, and virus problems. We pray that you'll give them every opportunity uh, and that they'll take every opportunity before them to share the truth of the message. We come before you with all these things, being thankful people, being understanding of your answers, with a hope and a trust that when we see you answer particular things, that we're people of gratitude, that we might thank you for what you've done. And even now, as we have a few moments as individuals to bring our individual quest, requests before you as the music plays, we are firmly trusting that you will answer the things we pray quietly, silently, and individually, in the same way that you'll answer the things we prayed as a group for. For we ask them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.
Okay, man. This morning's scripture reading is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 26. 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 26, if you'd like to follow along as I read. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. May God bless the reading of his word. As of today, we're glad to be able to restart our children's church. So those who are ages 3 to 7, you're in the activity center due to the, the nice rain that we're having out there. So today, head to the activity center. And uh, my wife's already over there ready for No, she isn't. She's hiding over here. She's not sitting in her normal spot this morning. She has a usual spot. I can look right back there and see her. She's over here. So they'll head out, and this will uh, go on for the summer, inside, outside, whatever the weather dictates, however we want to do the program. And then in the fall, we'll return to our normal schedule for children's church. Study through this book, 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2. You ever find something a week too late? I found the perfect illustration for last week, this week. Isn't that just, just how it goes? But, but uh, you know what? I'm going to use it anyway because the verses are mixed in here. Last week, out of the passage that Ed read this morning, we already look, we looked at last week uh, the words that we say, and there's some of the words that we say in these verses, uh, the foolish, unlearned, uh, questions avoid, they generate strife. Well, I found the perfect illustration for useless words this week. Uh, is there anybody from Oklahoma here that would be offended by me talking about Oklahoma? Good. All right. I, I figured that, but, you know, I don't want to offend people needlessly. Uh, Oklahoma legislator, last year, right in the middle of COVID and all the other problems that were going on, brought forth a bill for Oklahoma to allow a hunting season for Bigfoot. Yes. Well, there was a reason for this, because in his district, which is in southeastern Oklahoma, they have an annual Bigfoot festival. You know, I guess that's a big thing there, apparently. They have their Bigfoot Festival, and here's why he introduced this bill. Establishing an actual hunting season and issuing licenses for people who want to hunt Bigfoot will draw many more people to our already beautiful part of the state, and of course, while they are there, spend much more tourist money. By the way, that festival due to COVID got canceled last year, but nonetheless introduced the bill. As quickly was pointed out by many newspapers in Oklahoma, what a waste of time. Now, and there was some outcry to this. So he had to amend his bill with concerns that Bigfoot is an endangered species, <laughs> um, or imaginary species, however you look at it, but endangered, the bill then would only allow for trapping and releasing of Bigfoot, not for actually killing Bigfoot. Oh, our government spends a lot of time solving all the major problems that are important in our lives, don't they? Even in Oklahoma. Well, those are foolish words that uh, matter nothing, that generate strife and discussion, but at the end of the day, just don't matter. 
And that was a part of last week's message, and that would have been the perfect illustration for it last week, but I'll give it to you today. Today we move into the verses that surround that, though, in the same passage. These are really where Paul, who's writing to Timothy, Paul is in prison, about to die for his faith. Timothy is about to face severest persecution for continuing to preach. Paul now centers in on the first two chapters, talking to Timothy almost directly. In a couple weeks, we'll get to chapter 3, and Paul starts talking to us in our time, uh, things that are to come. And so we'll be more interested, perhaps, in that direct application of chapter 3. But the last words he has to Timothy, as he really hones in on his beloved friend and colleague Timothy, is to talk about being an honorable servant to the Lord. We've already looked at in chapters 1 and 2 the fears that Timothy might have to continue to serve the Lord because persecution is coming. Just as Paul is in prison facing perhaps his own death, Timothy would have to ask, as we've mentioned before, would that next be me? And so Paul encourages him to keep on, keep on, be a good soldier, uh, keep going forward. And Paul says, but go forward in honor. And in this passage, you noticed this kind of comparison illustration that's right here of vessels of gold and silver, wood and earth, honor and some to dishonor. And as you look at that passage, and as you look at that illustration, you may have said, I wonder what this is really referring to. And how does it refer to me serving the Lord with honor versus dishonor? And I think in this passage there are several things going on. Timothy, obviously, in verse 20, knows the Lord. Uh, in verse 19, rather, he knows the Lord, the Lord knows him, and they have a relationship. And Timothy has given to his life already that he names the name of Christ, he tries to depart from iniquity. But Christianity is more than just a moral life. Christianity is more than just doing what's right, and it is doing what's right, but it's also doing that which serves our Savior. It's doing that which ministers to the needs of others, and not just heaps blessing on ourselves. Timothy could be a great Christian and face no persecution if he just didn't do anything in a church. If he never preached, he never taught, he never shared the gospel, he could be a very nice-looking Christian and perhaps ward off any chance of being persecuted. But of what value is it just to be a nice-looking Christian if you're not affecting the lives of others? Because the call of God was to affect the lives of others. When Jesus came, did he just sit home you know, with his mom Mary and look like a good Christian? Or did he get out and did he minister? And did he talk to people and minister and teach people and preach to people and heal people and help people and ultimately die for our sins on the cross if we trusted in him? He did something for us. It wasn't just being a good believer. And for us who are Christians, it's not just about being a good believer. It's about being a vessel of honor. See, in this passage, you have several things that vessels do and several things that are alluded to here. One is the function of a vessel. And it's interesting. There are vessels of gold and silver, wood and earth, honor and dishonor. Some vessels, some pots, some dishes, whatever you want to call them back then, were made of gold and silver. Some were made of pottery. Some were made of more mundane things like wood. And I think we all even have stuff like that. I'm, I think there's a little wood in them. You see the wood salad bowls? You know, we still once in a while use something that's made of wood. And so there's a difference of ingredients. And then there's a difference of function. And oftentimes the function and the ingredients kind of line up together. When you have a normal meal every day, you don't get out the finest china, do you? You know, the stuff that if you look at it, breaks. No, you don't get that out. We just had the grandkids in. We didn't use the fine china with the grandkids in the house. Uh, you use the everyday stuff. that When it bounces on the floor, it actually bounces and doesn't shatter into a million pieces. Uh, you have the everyday stuff, and then you have the gold stuff, the silver stuff. The stuff that's made more to look at or for special occasions. They have different functions if it's referring to food. But it's even more than that with function because we have vessels of honor and dishonor. Dishonor is not necessarily, at first, a bad thing. How many of you tout 
the wonderful look and appearance of your garbage can. Oh, my garbage can. It, how many of you have a gold garbage can? Silver garbage can? Bronze? Garbage can. Not an honorable trade if you were minted as a garbage can, correct? We look at that and we say, oh, the garbage can. Now, the fine china is different. Even the regular china is different because they have different functions. And the gold stuff just sits there and we look at it. So you've got several things happening. You have different materials, different functions, and usually they line up because you don't have gold garbage cans. And then something is thrown in here in verse 21 that makes this make a little bit of sense. It says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, prepared for every good work. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But I think the thrust of this passage is, if you came over to my house, and if I had gold silverware, and well, gold silver silverware, and gold dishes, finest, and I put them before you, but they were covered with crud and dirt, and hadn't been washed in next to forever, and you were expected to put your food on my dirty gold, wonderfully you know, expensive dish, how many of you would just love to come over for the second meal? After that first meal, you'd say, I don't care that he serves on gold dishes. They were filthy. You know, I couldn't eat off of those. They were disgusting. Yes, even gold and fine, fine china can be disgusting. Now, you'd also say if I came over and I put on my garbage can and say, here's the garbage can lid, eat off of this, you'd probably say that was kind of disgusting too, even if it was spotlessly clean. Because you know where it's been, don't you? You know what it's been doing with its life. It's been collecting garbage. And so we look at all these vessels of honor and dishonor, various use, various makeup. And realistically, that speaks to the church. As individuals, we are all different. We have different talents, different gifts, different abilities. Now, in the church, I think wrongly to a point... Uh, vessels of honor are those of us who end up up front here. And people say, oh, that wonderful pastor, what a great message. You know, except I couldn't give any great messages at all had not a lot of other things gone on that you don't see and never will see that go on in this building in order for me to get up here on a Sunday morning to do this. Um, there's a million things that go on in the church, and there's a lot of vessels that don't have prime up front. Everybody sees them. Abby's brand new to this music thing, but she's up front. Everybody saw her. Uh, and so it's like, oh, somebody will probably say this afternoon, Abby played so nicely this morning. And uh, yet if she were just out doing the things behind the scenes, like those who faithfully will be doing children's church, those who faithfully do nursery, those who faithfully clean, fix, keep things going, our sound room, and on and on and on, that you just don't see on Sunday morning, but have just as big a role in part, we might consider those to be less honorable because they're not seen. And so we have this division today of the seen ministry versus the background ministry. But both of those are important, and both of those have talents and gifts that make up the whole. And both of them are of vital interest. Let me tell you, when you need a garbage can, you need a garbage can. Correct? It's just how it is. When you need that vessel, you need that vessel. When the mess has been made and the garbage needs to be picked up, you're yelling, bring the garbage can. Matter of fact, I'll bet you yelled that more than you ever yelled, bring the fine china. You probably never yelled that, did you? Nobody's screaming for the fine china, but they'll scream for the garbage can under the right circumstance. And so these vessels all have a use. They all have a place. They have an ingredient or material makeup that is appropriate for the particular vessel. Meaning that uh, the garbage can lid probably isn't made of gold. Meaning that what you eat off of probably doesn't look like the garbage can lid. But both have a role, both are important. So with the church. But both of them can be dishonorable. Both of them can come to the place where their service for God is not of honor. 
And the reason for that is verse 21, because they need to be purged and cleansed from sin. Dirty vessels don't serve God well. God doesn't like or take the service of dirty vessels, whether you're up front here or whether you're behind the scenes. When you try to do something for the Lord and you are dirty in sin, there's a problem. And that's what this is getting at. Timothy is a servant. He's out there preaching, teaching, and he's doing the leadership things, the things you would see. But there's a warning for Timothy. You have to maintain your life in such a way that you are not a dishonorable vessel. And the first way to do that, of course, is what we're already alluding to, and we'll get to all four in a moment, but that's to be cleansed. That's to be clean. And this cleansing in our lives is from sin that we accumulate as we live our lives. Sinful thoughts, sinful actions, sinful deeds, the things we do every day that need to be cleansed. The Lord says through the scripture in 1 John that we need to confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Cleanse us. What does that verse mean? Well, on the cross where Jesus died, the cleansing for our sin was accomplished as far as our salvation goes. If you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior and asked him to come into your life and forgive you, you will get to the eternity of heaven. You may make it on a bumpy road, but you will get there. And so we're not talking about cleansed and fit for heaven. We're talking about cleansed and fit for how you live your life and serve the Lord today. Because on a daily basis, we fall short. And we must, on a daily basis, keep our lives in fellowship with God. You don't find much fellowship with food when it's placed on a crummy, dirty, lousy, covered dish with crud all over it. Matter of fact, your stomach flips and turns, doesn't it, if you were to be forced to eat that. And some days God looks at us and he just looks at us today and he says, you're not cleansed. You are dirty. And if we go out and try to serve the Lord in some way, shape, manner, or fashion in that dirty, uncleansed state, we are in dishonor. And so we need to keep daily accounts with God of where we've failed and fallen, the thoughts we've had that might not have been pure, the actions we've had that might have been wrong, the thoughts we've had that might not have been, been pure or right. Because we want to have fellowship with God, just as you want to have fellowship with the food on your plate. Now, what is fellowship with the food on your plate? It's enjoying every bite of it, right? Nothing there to prevent you from saying, oh, this is so good. Um, some of us, we had a little get-together for Becca's graduation yesterday. There was some good-tasting food. And uh, the, the, the paper plate was not china. It wasn't spectacular. It wasn't gold. But there was nothing about that paper plate that kept me from having fellowship with my food. And I enjoyed it. Um, you know, God looks down upon us and he says, I want to enjoy fellowship with you. But when we're all dirty and we won't do anything about it, it's impossible for him to have that near fellowship to us. When you have little kids, or even bigger kids perhaps, and you're out of fellowship with them, they're still your kids. Correct? However, uh, there's some days they know better than to ask for something in, like a favor because of your status between parent and child. Just because we're not in good fellowship. We're disagreeing. There's a, a need for some kind of restoration of relationship. Uh, we've just had this feud. I've just been sent to my room. It's not the time to go ask for money from my, from my dad or my mom after I've just been punished. It's just not the time. And all of you young folks know that, and all of us who once were young folks remember that. You know, it's like rats. I can't ask for a favor now. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not close. And that's how we get with God on a daily basis. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and righteous to forgive it and restore us on that given day that we will be a vessel of honor, cleansed. And that's important. How do we serve the Lord in our lives? Well, first we serve the Lord by constant and continual cleansing, which is in verse 21. Purge and cleanse. How do we purge and get cleansed? We simply confess our sin, and he's faithful and righteous to cleanse us and restore our relationship. Now, that restored relationship may not undo the thing we just did. 
if you just told off your wife and did it in some very uh, negative terms, you may be back in fellowship with God, but I'll guarantee you guys you're not back in fellowship with the wife uh, until you do something further. And, of course, the first step might be to get back in fellowship with God, but you better follow that right up along the way with, a fe with getting back in fellowship with your wife. Um, and how do you do that? Pretty much the same way you do it with God. You confess your sin. That's all the same, isn't it? I shouldn't have said that, dear. And I'm picking on you guys because I'm a guy, but the same applies to you ladies if you ever do that to your husband. Some of you don't, but, you know, wait, maybe all of you do. Well, maybe you do. I don't know. I, I don't even comment on that. But it's the same. You know, we, we have fellowship when we have cleansed lives down here and with him above. And so that's the first thing. If you want to be an honorable servant of God, first, you must be cleansed. Second, in verse 21, you must be sanctified. Well, what's this mean? This means set apart. Set apart for the service of God. That means you actually have to do something. It's interesting, the word set apart means to be particularly set apart to God. And we look at this verse and we say, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a phrase that applies to the pastor, of course. It applies to maybe the musician, of course. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm pretty certain, though I didn't quiz her, Abby practiced before she came in today. You know, she didn't just get in here and, and say, oh, a piano, let me play. And she practiced. You have to set your time apart to do that. For those who teach, we'll be probably bringing our Sunday school back come fall, you know, in, in that time. And those teachers who will teach, they don't just go in there and say, I'm here to teach today, what should I do? They prepare. They set some time apart. We kind of look at this very narrowly as that kind of thing, but really it's not just that. We set our lives apart ready to serve. I know with Sunday school... It occurs on a Sunday morning. There's a set period of time. You know what the deadlines are. You know what you've got to get the lesson prepared and ready for the time of the, the class. And it's all laid out for you. But Christianity is not just a class. When someone comes to you unforeseen and never prepared for on Thursday morning and says, Can you help me? You've got no preparation time. It's ministry time. And you say, what could I help you with? Maybe what you can help them with is the saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And they say, I'm really struggling. I don't think I have a relationship with God. And that sets you in motion, set apart at that moment, to serve the Lord and explain to them that God loves them. He died on the cross for them. Maybe they come to you and they're a believer and they say, can you help me? I need somebody to pray for me. And you set yourself apart from whatever you were doing in that moment, and you pray with them. It's not just preparing a lesson, preparing a sermon, preparing to play a piano. It's that moment-by-moment -moment opportunity that we have to touch the lives of people who are around us in their need at that time when they need it. And so set apart means that I am available, God. Whenever you call, I'm available, and I will help somebody. I will pray for somebody. I will encourage somebody. I will share the gospel with somebody. I don't know when the time of that call is, but God, I'm set apart to do it. Use me. So the servant who's honorable is set apart for the opportunity to do what they can, when they can, when it comes. And then it goes on and it says, prepared for every good work. This is more of the class. This is more of, well, I've got a time frame. I have to preach here Sunday morning at 10. I can't be preparing this message at 10.05 while I'm sitting back there thinking, what am I going to say today? Uh, I probably could pull that off one week. The problem is if I had to pull it off two weeks, it'd be the same message probably because I just don't do that. And so that's the prepared part. But notice the set apart verse or part of the verse comes before the preparing part of the verse because if you're not set apart and ready it doesn't matter who God brings to your path if you don't want to help them you need to be set apart to serve then you can prepare to serve and prepare for the good works prepare for the ministries the things you can see ahead 
And then in verses 25 and 26 of this passage, there's one particular setting apart ministry that Paul points out to Timothy that needs to be done and that we tend to not do well with. And if you read the verses, it all of a sudden goes into talking about unbelievers. Who what? In verse 25. Who need the repentance according to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 26. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. One of the most important ministries we have as Christians is to share Christ. To live Christ as an example of what he would have done had he been here, and then to share from that example out of honor who our Savior is and what he can do for somebody else. The greatest need of a human soul is what? Well, as it's an unbelieving soul, the greatest need is to get out of the snare, the trap, the entrapment of the devil who has taken him captive by his will. And my Bigfoot illustration might almost fit here, because they allowed it to be only trap and release. Except with Satan, there's trap. But Satan has no release. Isn't that the truth? Satan has come to trap you and snare you, even as a Christian if he could, and he will with greatest reluctance ever release you. He wants to keep you trapped and snared and held. And who releases you from the captivity of sin? Initially, it's the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There is freedom in Jesus. Why? Because we are released from the penalty power of sin. That's what salvation's about. It's about forgiveness. It's not about a happy life here and now. Timothy is not living a happy life here and now when Paul writes to him. He's facing persecution for doing what's right. Paul is in prison, chained to a wall. He's not living a happy life here and now. It just befuddles me how we've reduced the gospel in some places to happy living. It is never about happy living. It's about a happy life after this life is over. That's what the gospel's about. That's when happy living begins. When we get there, it's not here. And if you have happy living now, that's great. God bless us. But it's not guaranteed. Persecution will take away happy living like that if the government decides to persecute you if you share Christ or minister. Paul's challenge to Timothy was, my brother Timothy, stay the course. Don't get off course. There are people out there ensnared, and you are the guy. You are the lady in this group, or the teenager, or the guy that has the ability to free the captives. I am very doubtful any of those Bigfoot hunters will ever ensnare one. Just pretty doubtful about that. And I'm certainly not the guy who's going to go releasing it after they ensnared it. I can tell you that. Uh, but I don't think they're going to ensnare the imaginary critter. But the ensnarement of Satan is not imaginary, it's real. And it's the power of the gospel applied to lives that, that, ins, that releases. And who comes with the message of that power? It's us who are believers. I'm also befuddled about this endless thought that ministry is about mass and groups and crowds. And it, it is to a point. You're a crowd this morning. Glad you're here. You're a crowd. But ministry, as God is concerned, is only partially about the crowds. God's ministry has far more central focus on me as an individual and how I relate to him. And that's of central importance. For all the crowds that Timothy might have preached to, Paul's closing personal words to him were, do it in honor. And that's not the crowd, that's the, the guy doing it. Do it in honor, be forgiven, be set apart and willing. Go out and prepare. And remember all those who need you to share Christ. It's an individual thing. And our relationship with Christ is by individual. I did not trust Christ as a part of a mass group. And even if you did trust Christ as a part of a mass group, you trusted him as an individual. We are individually saved by grace, not by group. And it's about individuals. And it's about ministry touching lives. 
We're in a day and an age where churches are gigantic and huge, and I'm not against that, but they've lost individuality. COVID certainly discouraged individuality. But with God, we're individuals, and people minister to other individuals. It's about one-on-one. -on -one. Perhaps of all the things Paul did, how many times do you think Paul preached to a group? My goodness, look at the book of Acts. We can't even begin to imagine. But of all the things Paul did, he went to a house where there was this guy named Timothy. And he shared the gospel with Timothy, his mother, and his grandmother. And they all believed. And look at what God did with the life of Timothy, whom Paul touched. It's not so much about how you minister, it's about the people you touch. Because ministry is individualized. I got to close. It's not the greatest illustration that fits this, but I like to update you on how things are in, in my life and in my world. About a month ago, I came with, a, it fit much better, the illustration of us saying goodbye in Florida to our grandkids. If you were here, you remember that. Um, we did not know they would be coming north as they just were here at that point in time, so we said goodbye to them. And our, our oldest grandson, Jackson, is three now. He's really beginning to understand things. Get into in, in that little brain of his that whirs around, figure things out. And I told you the story of saying goodbye to him and saying, I told him I would miss him, and he responded back, I will miss you. And, you know, that was very, you know, if we'd have known it was going to be just two and a half weeks, it wouldn't have been so meaningful at the time, but we thought it was going to be two and a half months or more. So they were here uh, for, for 10 days, and uh, we enjoyed having them. And last Thursday morning, they began their, their trek back to Florida driving. And it was very strangely similar. Here he is in his seat in the back of the, of the excursion. Um, and he asked me the same question, much dumber this time, though. He said, are you coming with us? And I looked at that excursion, and I said, and where am I going to sit in here? All their stuff was in every spot beside people. You know, I, I couldn't have got in there had you, you got a crowbar and tried to pry me into that thing, you know. Where am I going to sit? And he just looked around, and he said, uh, well, I, he didn't know. And I said, you know, I, I didn't want to say I'm going to miss you again. I, I just, I said, I'm not doing that. So he looked around and says, well, I don't know. And then he looked at me, and he said, I will miss you. I didn't say it. People, that's what it's about, individuality. It's about people. It's not about mass. My grandkids are mine. They don't mean necessarily the same to you as they do to me. Likewise, your grandkids don't mean the same to you as to me as they do to you. It's about individuals and touching lives and being a part of lives. And that's what Timothy is doing. And even in persecution, that's hard. Even in our lives, that can be hard. There are people who don't want our touch, and we can't force it on them. There's people who don't want our gospel, and we can't push it on them. But it is about touching lives. And I will say this, if you are not a vessel of honor... You're not going to do much touching of lives for God. If you are not cleansed, set apart, prepared, ready to go, if you're mired in sin and struggle and you won't go to God to confess it and you're a dirty piece of silverware that somebody's trying to put a meal on, God's not going to accomplish much of that touching lives with you. You have moved yourself to a place that you are non-usable. Just like my gold platter would be covered with filth, non-usable for a meal. I hate the thought that I would be that as a preacher. And I would think you would hate the thought that you would be that as a servant of God with whatever ministry he's called you to do. Because he challenges Timothy, be the honorable vessel made of whatever you're made of to whatever ministry you're called. Do it with a whole heart, honorably before the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God, for this challenge to Timothy. It certainly reminds us that it's not about being up front. It's not about being popular. It's not about being seen as a servant. It's about being one. In a moment of time when no one else that we even know might see sharing the gospel. In a moment of time when somebody hurting calls us on the phone or texts us and says, can you help me? being available, and being a servant. It's about being prepared for that moment by being cleansed. It's about 
a right relationship with you on a daily basis, confessing our sins that we're ready to go. In that same challenge Paul gave to his beloved Timothy, I believe you give to us today as your beloved servants. Help us to be vessels, honorable, ready to serve you. And we'll thank you for those service moments you give us and for what you accomplish through us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close this morning, we're going to sing As the Deer. It's an old chorus from way back. And we'll, we'll sing it together. You can stand. And hope you remember this is about you and me. Father, we thank you that we can worship you, praise you, be cleansed by you on a daily basis, and walk with you in fellowship, and thus be a vessel fit for honorable service, whether we be the vessel that's of silver or gold or of pottery or wood, may we do what you've called us to with rejoicing, with a whole heart, and may you bless our service as we do it for you. Help us throughout this week, whatever we face, wherever we go, whatever is in our paths, that you might not only be with us, but that you will sustain us, keep us, and in all ways, have us look to you for what we need in that moment. 
and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.